Good afternoon, everyone. The Jenny Mosk, Mopti region, Mali, Bandiagara Cliffs, same Mopti region. Massive floods in one of the driest places on the planet. Media beginning to drip feed that we're seeing cycles and we're understanding where the disturbances in the atmosphere are. Now they're even saying that there's patterns of linkage in extreme rainfall and hail events. So you know, governments know, when they're updating their flood maps in capital cities, when we start to see rare tornado, rare tornado, rare tornado in three different spots on the planet in the same week that don't normally get tornadoes, and the media trying to cover up five feet of ice by saying, oh no, the ice was floating on the water, yet we see images like this on how deep a single hailstorm was in Guadalajara, Mexico. The atmosphere is changing, definitely. Climate revolution, the grand solar minimum. Understand, prepare, adapt, and thrive. I cover this in my book already with flooding and droughts, how the jet streams are going vertical, completely out of their flows, which would be expected in the grand solar minimum, as well as the formation of the new equatorial vortex, cloud cells driving different cloud layers together in the atmosphere as more cosmic rays produce more clouds and we're getting all these rainouts and these different events across the planet it's explainable through cycles climate revolution the grand solar minimum the links in the description box below and it's another way for you to support and keep this channel on air bringing you information just like this Now you knew eventually they were gonna to have to start drip feeding information about all these changes related to our climate and sun connection. Researchers find patterns associated with extreme floods. Well, if it's a pattern, it's sure not CO2. So here they are, you know, it's admitting it straight out now that it's a pattern, it's a cycle. Spatial domain where each pattern is dominant. What they're finding is repeating cyclical activity in our atmospheric flows creating extreme floods. They even pinpoint on the map with which El Nino or La Nina event. Those aren't CO2 driven, those are natural cycles. If you're looking, but most people would skip right over this, you'd never even see it in your local newspaper. You have to actually seek this out online and then you would find it. But related with this type of story rundown, scientists link California droughts and floods to distinctive atmospheric waves. Obviously it's a cycle if it's a wave. Study finds more extreme storms ahead for California. New scale to characterize strength and impacts of arc storms. I've covered this before in a video. Now they're bringing a five plus level because they know the intensity of arc storms are gonna increase based on the intensification of the grand solar minimum and the way our jet streams are bending and colliding in the atmosphere. See, all these things are preparing your mind for these changes. They already know these changes are coming. It's cyclical. We see these every 400 years, and they're just telling you now, hey, we're in it again. Things are going to amplify, and there is expected changes. And now, interestingly enough, this article is from January of this year. They're trying to say that as a butterfly's wings will cause a typhoon on the other side of the planet, something very similar. Global patterns of extreme rainfall are linked to each other through the atmosphere, not over land. So if we're seeing extreme atmospheric changes, you would also see extreme rainfall, hail, and wind events too, would you not? So they're linking everything back to central India and saying five days out extreme rainfalls can be predicted in other parts of the world and different countries between there, depending on the atmospheric flows. Now if these go out of flow, which they're expected to, well, they're telling you there's another change right here and they're even explaining it with a nice graphic. They don't call it rainfall events. Notice that extreme rainfall events. They're already preparing your mind for extremes and extreme rainfall is all we're seeing now. There's no more normal steady rainfall for crops. Everything's an extreme. And also when we're taking a look at some of the driest places on our planet, Mali, Western Africa, Djenne, Mosque, incredibly famous, beautiful photo-esque, Timbuktu in the back of the mind on this one. Where is this exactly? Area of Mopti there in the red, or you can see it in Mali in the orange on the left side of the chart there, wide out into the western portion of Africa so you can get a good indication where this is. Some of the driest area on our planet. Now something obviously happened there in the past as well because if you look at the Bandigara Cliffs, you'll see something very similar to what we see with the Anasazi and the cliff dwellings in New Mexico, Arizona region, the four corners of the United States, 
What is it with dolmens and cliff dwellings to run from either plasma discharge, extreme winds, or some types of atmospheric anomalies on our planet? We see this all around the world. Why don't you jump over to Turkey and take a look at Cappadocia? Why did they build all those underground cities? Something cyclic in nature is coming back here. And also, I do want to bring you to a real point in history here with the salt and the value of salt. You have to realize how easy it is for us to obtain salt these days. This area of the world was also one of the largest salt producers, one of the wealthiest regions on the planet when they were dealing with salt several thousand years ago. The caravans that came through in the salt trade, the salt blocks that were traded were equal to their weight in gold. That's how valuable salt was. That's how valuable it will be as a tradable commodity in the future. Grid down, long-term food storage, an enormous amount of salt will be incredibly beneficial to you in so many ways. But now we can just run out and buy a pink Himalayan sea salt lamp at your local store, comparatively to the secrecy they kept while mining salt in the desert two millennia ago. The reason I bring this up in this region is Mali, one of the driest places on our planet. Floods and rain damage through the refugee camps. Now, if this didn't damage a refugee camp, this story probably would have not made the news. But the before and after, and it's not just a puddle there. It's miles and miles of inland delta filling up. And I understand that they do have seasonal rainfalls there, but this is in the wrong place completely for the seasonal rainfall. And it doesn't usually flood out in these areas. That's why the refugee camps are there. They didn't want to put them in the flood risk zone. You're not going to put them in a delta where it's going to flood. Yet this place flooded. And again, other anomalies that you're starting to see. Governments across the planet know exactly what's happening with this grand solar minimum intensification. Case in point here, Australia updating the flood maps for Canberra. The most comprehensive flood risk assessment map ever. And they doubled, doubled the areas that were showing flood risk. Why is that? Why did they go to the... Uber and doubling instead of just 100, it's once in a century flood, once in a two century flood wasn't good enough anymore. Why'd they bring that thing up so high? What are they planning for? The new flood assessment risk map there for you. All the links are in the description box below for everything I'm talking about in the video tonight. And what's most interesting, human influence climate change is behind the floods in South China, but not Chennai. So I'm glad they're so precise with the science that they can even peg a flood. Which one's human induced with CO2? See, that's how good the science is, right? We've got these phenomenal hail accumulations, not talking about any CO2 driven over here. This is purely an atmospheric compression event. This is the beginning. Now imagine if this is a snowstorm in the middle of winter, your city is completely blocked in. You're going to run out of food if you don't have food in your homes. If this is a snowstorm like Buffalo, you'd be locked in your home for a month or more. Do you think you can actually survive in your home with a month? Do you have enough food in your house right now? And the media was so quick to dismiss it. Oh, it's floating hail and water. Don't worry about it. We'll come into that in a second here, but more atmospheric anomalies. Now, what are the statistical chances in three days to have extremely rare tornadoes in three parts of the world? What statistical possibility is that? Extremely rare large tornado hits southern Taiwan. There's a Linbian in Wanhua townships, and then we get the EF2 tornado in Bendigo, Victoria, Australia, and then we have another rare tornado in Liaoning province in China. People were so caught off guard, they'd never even seen one of these before. They didn't know what to do. And the news media even cited tornadoes in this region are rare. Well, all these news articles that you're seeing, rare tornado, rare tornado, and then we have this freak hailstorm that everybody picked up. I mean, every single publication across the planet published this story here. From business publications all the way to regular mainstream media. Unbelievable how much coverage this got. Well, it was an incredible storm. Phenomenal hail accumulations after massive hailstorm. Guadalajara, Mexico, five feet. But then the media was trying to dismiss it after it got so much traction. They're like, well, it was really, it was just a hail. And it got in somewhere a little deep, and then it started to melt, so the water rose, and then it was pushing the hail up, so it looked deeper than it was, really. And there, it was really just water under there. It was the final, they had to report on it, and then they tried to switch the narrative during the middle of the story to try to dismiss the actual thickness of the hailstorm. This is what gets me. Now, these are people walking across. It actually stopped those 18-wheel trucks and buried them. So how capable of our modern infrastructure are we ready to deal with a five-foot hail storm or a five-foot snowstorm that drops in an hour? So I wanted to dismiss these stories right away of saying, oh, it was just a bunch of water under there pushing it up and it was really just a real flood and it was only a few inches of hail and that's what we're seeing. Uh, 
I don't see any water under the hail there. And I thought, well, let me dig a little deeper. Maybe that's just one single photo. And then, oh, here we have another one. Check out that woman on the bottom there. And those cars, those are being pushed up like an avalanche would be or a mudslide where the vehicles get pushed because if it was water, that car wouldn't be tail have extending out of the ice itself. Now, I've talked about these same events with the flooding and the droughts in the Grand Solar Minimum Climate Revolution. The jet streams are now going vertical. They're completely out of their flows. Magnetosphere is weakening. Our magnetic poles are on the, on the move. Now, this new phenomenon called the equatorial vortex, this is where we're getting a lot of these heat spikes from. You're familiar with the polar vortex that pulls cool air down from the Arctic? Well, we have this new one evolving. They just renamed this thing a couple of years ago called the equatorial vortex. You don't hear about it in the news too much because it explains the heat. And when you hear a vortex, you're like, I never heard that one before. But it's called the equatorial vortex. And it's doing the same thing the polar vortex is doing, only from the equatorial bands, bringing warmer air up into places like Norway. Oh, it's global warming. No, it's the grand solar minimum in a 400-year or 2,000-year cycle bending our weather. And it's going to get more intense and more extreme. All explained in the climate revolution. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you got something out of it. And tonight's video has been brought to you by trueleafmarket.com, heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. Another essential skill set I do cover in the book is you're going to have to grow food. That's why I'm so much a fan of seeds sprouting, growing, grow guides, share with your friends, have fun. It's a camaraderie type of thing that you'll never experience except for growing food together, harvesting it together, and eating together after you've grown it for months and months. Hope you can have that same experience with some of your friends, and I'll see you next video.